Ken Fisher, welcome to CNN Money Switzerland. What brings you here to well, Switzerland? At this moment, I'm here to be with you, Hannah, and thank you very much. <laughs> but uh, basically, I come to uh, Switzerland, Zurich specifically, uh, a couple times a year, no particular designated time. Uh, we, uh, my firm manages a little over a, a billion Swiss franc for a variety of customers here in Switzerland. Uh, we have business all over Europe. I'm in Europe every 45 to 60 days in varied cities all over Western Europe. So this is an important part of the world for you? Europe is a very important part of the world for us. Um, Switzerland? Of course, the firm starts in its origination in America. By definition, I'm a Yank. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reality of that, however, is that in more recent times, uh, since 2008, we've expanded heavily into Europe with the biggest focus is being in Britain and Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, uh, uh, the other countries we operate in every Western European country. As an outsider then, how is Switzerland viewed as a financial hub? Mm, there's the good part and the bad part, like there is with almost every place and everything. Uh, the good part is that it's seen as big and significant in finance as a hub. The negative part that I'd say is it's seen as relatively uh, conventional. It's not seen as where most of the leading innovations of the last couple of decades have come from. And of course, usually in an overly seemingly arrogant way for a Yank, um, most of those innovations have come from America. Most so you of think the that new Switzerland could do more? Sure, of course. Um, th th if, you, if you just think of America, once upon a time, America used to refer to Yankee ingenuity. Now they talk about disruptive technology. But uh, new products, whether it's uh, exchange-traded funds, mm. uh, alternatives, um, now exchange-traded notes, mm -hmm. all of these things have tended to originate out of America as opposed to product. Now, I'm not in the product business. I'm in the management and advice business. But all of this stuff has tended to originate mostly out of America. You say that, though, but, you know, right here in Switzerland, we have what we are calling Crypto Valley. We are kind of putting ourselves right out there when it comes to cryptocurrencies and blockchain. What do which, you think about that? Which are two very different things. They are. Blockchain is significant material. Uh, crypto is largely uh, comedy. Uh, the uh, reality of crypto as uh, functions an oxymoron because... Uh, currency is stable value, widely readily acceptable as a medium of exchange, therefore can't have variable mm. pricing and has to have uniform uh, re receipt capability. Crypto doesn't have any of that, and it never will. And in fact, governments won't allow it because the major justification for it is the secretive portion. And if we just look through the history throughout the developed world, Governments have increasingly wanted to block that. And if you think of uh, sort of the negative part of the history of Switzerland's image in finance, mm -hmm. it was this notion of the secret Swiss account, which in recent decades have been pressure against. And, of course, the crypto part wants to go back toward that. But the governments of the world to actually make currency, you know, you, you go to Italy, uh, you could take out uh, 3,000 euro before you report it to the government. In America, you take a $10,000 before you report it to the government. They don't want large amounts of money being in cash. Do you th would you go as far want, as to say, though, Because they want though, trackability. That, did you, would you go as far as to say, though, that uh, cryptocurrencies are dangerous? Mm, let's, if, if I'm a drug dealer, I'd much rather use cryptocurrency than green bills or pink bills or uh, any other color bills. The reality of the danger is as a money, they're volatile. And they can't be a money because you can't have money be volatile. If but you think aren't of, you judging if you think it at the very early stage, though? Uh, money has always been staple value. The whole okay. point of money in its origination, uh, when it started as metallic only, was to create stable value. Blockchain is different. Blockchain is a usable technology mm. for accounting and delivery of systems, which is valid and has multiple uses across the spectrum of commerce, but that's different than the concept of crypto, which currency it is not. Currency requires stable value, wide, ready acceptance. I can't buy petrol 
with crypto. Will blockchain change the financial industry? Sure. Um, but all technology changes the financial industry. But remember, and this is the part that people get wrong, technology is necessary but not sufficient. In the end, we are not going to get, I do not believe, this is my opinion, mm. not fact, opinion, we're not going to get to where artificial intelligence truly replaces humans because the nature of Capital markets in a broad spectrum, stocks, bonds, currency trading, commodity trading in general, is inherently nonlinear. And artificial intelligence basically requires linearity. And those two don't really reconcile well. And there's nothing about blockchain that changes that reality. And in that reality is the point that it's a necessary tool to use. And you use technology, including blockchain, like it's a sophisticated tool as if if you had a better hammer for construction, you'd want the better hammer. Do you think you have But it doesn't school? change the fact that the purpose of the hammer is to build the building or the furniture or whatever you're building. It's not the technology for the sake of the technology. Is that an old school uh, viewpoint, though, do you believe? I do not believe in a world of nonlinearity, linear applications can be made nonlinear. I don't believe that changes. I, when you say old school, I, I think it's a fundamental truism about the way markets work. The reality is there's very broad application for blockchain, but in markets, you have to be able to deal with nonlinearity. It's the part that George Soros always would have talked about. It's inherently the fact that you have to be able to anticipate the change. You have to be able to make up 100% of your mind with effectively 20% of the facts. So what about exchange-traded funds then? I mean, exchange-traded funds are a blessed pretty, tool. Yeah. They're a blessed okay. tool, but they're perfectly linear. Okay. Right? They're not about market change. They're a, a perfect tool. Tools are good. I'm all for tools. Blockchain's a good thing. Creation of tool is useful. Technology, whether it's just simply, you know, all of the creation of this stuff mm -hmm. that never could have been conceived of when I was a boy in the 1950s, uh, to it's all good. Uh, we want the tools, but we don't want to confuse the tools with the purposes. Does financial disruption concern you at all? No. Not at all? No. You, you want an answer I give you? It's a really short answer. It's about the shortest answer, answer I know how to give. <laughs> the, fa the fact of the matter is, uh, we, uh, I was telling someone earlier today uh, when uh, we were talking about uh, some things in the future that may be scary to people like driverless cars, uh -huh. and then eventually maybe after that pilotless planes, which are actually a safer delivery system than a driverless car by far. Uh, I mean, a driverless car has to deal with all forms of chaos that a plane doesn't actually have to deal with. Mm. Uh, I mean, we have drones that work almost perfectly right now. They're just very expensive. Uh, and they're pinpoint uh, precision accurate. Uh, and most Plane crashes come from pilot error, not from mechanical failure. But my point uh, about disruption is that my grandfather, born in San Francisco, California, in 1875, would tell me when I was a little boy about how he remembered when people were afraid to have electricity in their house because all that stuff that was running around in the walls would be so dangerous. And disruption's been going on, uh, replacing gas lanterns. Disruption's been going on forever, and disruption's actually good, assuming that it's functional. And the experimentation that goes with that is one that has multiple failures for breakthrough successes. The breakthrough successes pay for everything. Tried hard my whole life, but more importantly, I've tried hard with lots of little experiments and then let lots of little failures happen to find the successes that work. Mm. And you just keep doing that. The reality of most people that have had big, big successes in life is they were prepared to entertain lots of little failures. And is that still how you uh, manage your, your finances? You Finances, my activities. Most of my life has been trying things that people otherwise didn't do. Uh, let me for just example, describe something. Yeah. Well, for example, uh, two years ago, I started talking to people in Europe about in countries like Denmark, Sweden, Italy, Spain, the Netherlands, where no person outside of their country had ever been a columnist, 
doing columns for them. Mm -hmm. I was always told that was impossible. You can't do that. We don't do that in our country. I'm, a, I'm the first columnist that's ever written that's a non-native countryman in all of those countries. I, I write in Sweden for Doggins Industry. I write in Borson, the leading financial paper. I write in, the, and over and over. That's why, because I'm prepared to embrace the failure. Well, I was going to ask, what, what are your failures? Do you have many? Sure, but they don't actually show much, because what happens is you don't make big bets out of nowhere. You make lots of little bets, and when they fail, no one notices them. So, for example, in America, we advertise a lot. The advertising that my firm does is all try this, try that, try the other, see what works. No one of them costs very much. When you find one that works, it pays for the failures. Everything that I do is little bets, or you take the risk of failing for one that works, and then you push it big. I think it would be fair to say that we're very much more cautious here in Europe, and in particular Switzerland, when it comes to trying and failing. Do you the feel Swiss like... Always, the Swiss have always been very cautious. Uh, yeah, I mean, do you think your successes then are down to your kind of uh, American mentality? I'm a Western American, which is even more that way, yes. If you think of America mm. as opposed to Europe, traditionally the entire Western movement in America was people taking a risk. And the Westerner has always been a little bit more prone to taking a risk and being experimental, which is why Silicon Valley comes from the West, why Hollywood came from the West, uh, why gambling came in America came mm -hmm. from the West. Uh, and that portion, I think, is inherent in uh, American thinking, and even more so in Western American thinking. Do you think that will change, though, in Switzerland? Do you think we'll become more like that? I think one feature of reality in modern life is that we're all becoming a little more like each other. Uh, if, if you think of that in some other ways, I was speaking to someone else earlier today, I think if you look through the number of languages that exist in the world today, there are fewer than before. Mm -hmm. Uh, even though there's still several hundred languages that exist in the world, if you look in terms of the GDP-weighted or language-weighted economies of the world, 30 languages are 95% of global GDP. And the other 5% uh, is almost all agricultural or natural resource extraction. And that represents hundreds of languages that will probably be disappeared in 20 years and we probably ultimately come down to a handful of languages, and all of that comes back down to a world that centralizes around what these kinds of things, which won't be this big and may even just fit on your ear or whatever, will be 20 years from now. So we're increasingly becoming Americanized. More like each other. Well, you're not just becoming Americans, you're becoming more Europeanized, too, all at the same time. I don't, I don't think President Donald Trump would agree with that, would he? President Donald Trump's uh, a little bit unique. He is. Just a little bit. How do you think his um, strategy has impacted global markets, financial industry? It's uh, doing well for the economy. So let's think of that in a different way. Let's think of uh, President Trump as the middle of a continuum with something before it and something after it. Let's start with June of 2016, shortly before he's elected, mm -hmm. and look at the Brexit vote. Brexit's approaching. People say if Brexit passes, there'll be chaos. Britain will promptly go into recession, and it will threaten the existence of the EU. Stock markets will implode. In fact, Brexit passes. Overnight, there's some concern, and the stock market rises. Sterling falls, but the British economy continues to grow. You go forward a few more months, there is a notion that if Donald Trump is elected, there'll be chaos, the stock market will fall apart. Trump's elected, the market immediately goes up. Dollar falls, economy continues to do well. And then you move forward, and then people fear uh, Marine Le Pen. She's not elected, but then you move forward more recently into March, and the Five Star Movement with the League mm -hmm. gets elected in Italy. People say if that happens, it will be disaster for Italy the reality of it will be that uh, Italy will have expenses that it cannot afford. That will cause it to break from the euro, and all hell will break loose. In the meantime, 
The Italian stock market's been the strongest stock market among developed markets this year. The Italian economy has not deteriorated. And I'm making a point to you, this is a continuum. These people aren't the cause, but they aren't the problem that people had feared. And when there's fear of a false factor, markets and economies do well. I mean, this all relates back to something you said on CNN Money back in 2015, that, you know, these kind of major geopolitical situations that we find ourselves in every few months are bumps in the road and the markets yes. carry on around that. I, but I wonder if the President I'm Trump so is, much that you did that more, research. is much more of a, than, than just a bump in the road. The President of the United States is always important, uh, sort of like a new comedy on TV is always important. Uh, now, mind you, I don't want to underestimate Donald Trump. I think history has littered recently with mm -hmm. people that have underestimated uh, President Trump. But I, I think so many people either like what he's doing or hate what he's doing that they can't quite see him for what he is. He operates in a constitutional system that limits the power of the United States president. You have to have both, the, for most mm -hmm. things, you need the cooperation of Congress, you need the Supreme Court to not, or the court system, to not strike it down. That limits the power the president it always has. President Trump has some powers. He will use those powers. Beyond that, he does not have so much power. President Trump does one thing over and over again that people can't seem to avoid. He likes to do this while he's doing something over here you don't much notice. And that portion of doing something glittery that attracts and distracts has been a standard Trumpian tactic. And he's done that over and over again, as I wrote uh, in uh, uh, the period of March. Mm. The function of everything that he's doing about tariff talk cannot possibly be about economics. It's all about North Korea. Now it's extended to Iran. It's all about military foreign policy. And you know that by the fact that the Commerce Department was never involved. The Commerce Department what negotiates trade deals. The fact of the matter, who went, who went over to China? Who, who went to North Korea? Pompeo. Yeah. Okay. The fact of the matter is both. Uh, he announces the Chinese tariff deals. The next week, for the first time ever, Kim Jong-un, as head of state, leaves North Korea and goes to Beijing the very next week. Are we all being duped by him then? I wouldn't call it duped. Do a glittery thing over here while I'm doing something over here. You got to... When, when, whenever Trump's doing this, you have to look away from it and say, what else is going on? That's what he does. Now, mind you, do I have any ability to predict Donald Trump? No. Do I think I do? No. The fact of the matter is I know this is always a distractive technique that he uses. And people can't get themselves to stop looking at this and start looking around at other things. Because so do you rate him as a president or do you rate him then as a businessman? Or neither? I tend to <laughs> underweight the power of presidents. Okay. The fact of the matter is I don't think that the rising stock market in 2017 was because of Donald Trump. I also don't think it was, uh, I don't think he was that much of a positive or that much of a negative. What I said in my public writing at the time of the election was that I was very confident that he would win or Mrs. Clinton would win, one or the other. I was, I'd studied it and I was sure and that either one would win and that whichever one won, the stock market would go up. Because what we had and have in an American election like that is a lot of uncertainty. And with the aftermath of an election like that, you get falling uncertainty, and markets love falling uncertainty. And so these little bumps in the road, the markets carry on around them. So what is going to be the big upset in the near future? I mean, where are we going to see that come from? I don't... Uh, see a big upset it in the short term future. <laughs> um, what, what I believe goes on right now that people don't appreciate is the financial structure propels this bull market forward with, of course, irregular bumpy volatility. Mm. So let's just take a second. If you take the PE of the market on a global basis, which varies country by country based on the sectoral makeup of the valuations of the sectors that vary by country. You look at a global PE of about 15, 16, and you flip that into an EP of about 1 16th. Mm -hmm. And that's what we would get if we owned the whole stock market forever and earnings never went up or down after tax. Okay. Now we compare that 
to the average long-term corporate borrowing rate, which is a pre-tax number, and adjust it for global tax rate, and there's a 100% markup. That is, if I issue long-term debt, which the Swiss are always very afraid of because Swiss are debt-phobic, and I buy back my own stock, I get an instant 100% markup because the return on this is twice the cost of that. And then I shrink the shares, and so not only did my earnings immediately go up, but my earnings per share went up even more because mm -hmm. I got more earnings and even less shares. And that spread, which is criticized for the amount of stock buybacks mm -hmm. and debt-fueled stock cash-based stock takeovers, is actually fundamentally in the way capital structure is supposed to work, improving the balance sheets of global America, or glo global corporations. And people don't get that that transaction is actually improving the capital structure of the corporations at the same time that it improves earnings, improves the efficiency, it's seen as an artificial financial engineering. It's not artificial at all. It's real free money. And the real free money translates into shrinking supply of equity, and the shrinking supply of equity propels the bull market forward. Well, talk to me then about how you see the rest of 2018 playing out. You see continued volatility? Markets like to be volatile, but I will give you a real simple lesson. It's something that I don't believe anyone in Switzerland understands. If you look at the U.S. stock market, it's basically half the global stock market. Yes. If you look at the non-U.S. stock market, and if you knew which way the U.S. market was going, you can't find an extended time period where the non-U.S. market and the U.S. market go opposite directions. Sometimes the U.S. leads, sometimes the U.S. lag, but they always go the same direction. Mm -hmm. Once you get that, you also know that the Swiss market goes the same direction the non-U.S. market goes. Mm -hmm. Now, I will give you a simple fact. It's what I call the 87% miracle that no one in Switzerland will know about. If you actually look at the entire history of the global stock market, if you take the quarter in which there is a U.S. midterm election, 87% mm -hmm. of the time that quarter is positive, much more than the stock market as a whole, and if you take the first quarter of the subsequent year, 87% of the time, that quarter is positive. People don't understand that fact because it's the end of a falling uncertainty period. Therefore, you've got a very high probability that the U.S. market accelerates at the end of the year, continuing into the first quarter of next year. And if that happens for six months, you will get the non-U.S. market doing that. And if that happens, the Swiss market will do it also. Will the U.S. lead or lag that process this time? I do not know. But what I know is, you give me an 87% factor, I'm going to bet on it every time, unless I got some real strong thing I know otherwise. So as I look toward the end of the year, I expect the markets to wiggle around and then accelerate in the fourth quarter into the first quarter of next year. So we're still looking at a positive outlook for the, for the coming years. Yeah, what we've been doing at the beginning of this year is freaking people out mm -hmm. and reducing the optimism that was built last year. That's setting the stage for the next run. Okay. Ken Fisher, fabulous. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thanks for having me on, Hannah. You do a great job. Thank you. <laughs>